Hello, Miguel. Can we do a mic check, please? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Hello, Member Silver. Can we do a mic check, please? Yeah, this is Damon. We can, can you hear me? you. Yes, thanks very much. Hello, Member Esparza. Can we do a mic check with you, please? Hi, I'm here. Is it working? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mary, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you, ma'am. How are you? Oh, I'm so glad I got to hear you. I turned off my audio for a minute there. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Todd, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. And Laura and Tony Williams. This is like Miss Marianne. And I see Todd mm -hmm. and I see Laura. And I see Rose. I actually say that in my Zoom class when I'm teaching. Yep. Really? <laughs> that or, or Hollywood Squares. I make references about that. <laughs> and you have to be a certain age, right? Like exactly. My, my office would be like, what? I'm 12. <laughs> I can fix your computer, but beyond that, I got nothing. <laughs> Thanks for pausing the recording. Yeah. Um, well, good afternoon. I'm doing the two minute warning. We're gonna let everybody uh, join up and I will remind you, um, I'm gonna ask if folks can keep their um, uh, their mics off, I mean on for, I mean uh, hot for a moment, which is so that we can do roll call. And then we're gonna do um, public comment and then our consent calendar and then you can go on mute because uh, we've got some really, really, really interesting presentations today. So I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and discussion. Miguel, I think that's very understated. <laughs> I think that's just shh. Yeah, like the, the muted colors, I know, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it is a reminder. Wow, wow a lot happening in the world. <clears throat> We'll give it just a minute more and we'll go ahead and do um, the roll call. Yeah, well, I really like that back that uh, background you got there. Is that awesome? And and I saw you on a commercial on my uh, on my TV for, for the census. Oh, you saw Is Miguel? Right? I, saw him. I was like, hey, I know that guy. You're in a commercial? That's so cool. I heard it. I don't, um, I, I, I kind of live a, a weird life where I don't watch Hulu or Netflix or anything like that, but I heard I was on Hulu too. Wow. <laughs> now I've got to subscribe. There you go. <laughs> You've arrived. <laughs> this is 14. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to see you, even if it's virtually, um, today for our Reentry Network uh, 1021 meeting. We're going to go to call to order, public uh, comment, and then to our consent calendar. Uh, public comment today will be two minutes throughout the meeting uh, and for input. And then um, we've got some really great presentations. For each of the present presentations, I'm going to ask that the presenters present, and then we open it up for questions and discussion. Uh, um, I'm sorry, presenters present, public comment, and then open it up for discussion. And um, anyway, lots of interesting things happening, so I'm glad to see all of you. So if I could turn to the clerk to call the roll. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, we'll go through uh, by seat number and then go back again in case we missed anyone, if that's okay. That'd be great. Okay. Um, Chairperson Chavez. Here. Member Smith. Here. Uh, Member Tomalinas. Member Ryan. Uh, Member Wapensky. Here. M Member Garnett. Here. Member Cody. Or Member McClinton Brown, the alternate for that seat. No. Member Esparza. Here. Member O'Neill. Here. Member Here. Silver. Member Silver. Oh, oh, we have. Molly O'Neill, my apologies. Uh, member Rosen or Member Angel? Member Nikolai or Member Winter? Member Menacucci or Member Shing? Member Tarao? Here. Member Mills? Here. Member Duan or Member Olmos? Steve Olmos is present. Thank you. Member Gaxiola? Present. Member Fisk? Here, thank you. Member Marquez? You're muted. Oh, here. Thank you. Uh, member Aaron O'Brien? Member Aaron O'Brien? Oh, you're uh, muted. She's here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, member Amador Lebeau? Here. Member Williams? Here. Um, member Christine Clifford? Member Manley? Member Hernandez? Member Consuelo Hernandez? Here, David. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, member Paramatam? Here. Thank you. Member Crocker Cook? Here. Member Vigeni? Here. Uh, Member Garcia or Member Tyndall? Here. Tyndall. Thank you. Member Halcon? Member Amanda Clifford? Here. Sorry. Member Halcon is here. I was muted. I apologize. Thank you. And Member Kendrick? I saw Todd. Uh, here. I'm here. Member, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also McClinton Brown has joined us. McClinton Brown, thank you very much. And hi, I'm Judge, judge Ted Zaner here. The, I'm the assistant presiding judge and Judge Ryan regretfully has a conflicting meeting and asked me to stand in. And sorry, I wasn't, I thought I was connected, but didn't, wasn't able to speak up when you called seat four. Oh, uh, thank you very much for that. Okay. And um, I also couldn't figure out how to change my name, even though I thought I knew how to do that in Zoom. That's we'll have good. to, the, the host has to change your name. Okay. Can you give us your name one more time, please? I'm yeah, sorry. It's, uh, last name Zayner, Z-A-Y-N-E-R, uh -huh. first name Ted. Okay. One moment, Mr. Zayner, we'll have the host change your name for you momentarily. All right, thank you. Okay. Also, this is uh, Pat Nikolai. I was, uh, had to restart it as well. I understood. Thank you very much. Uh, member, uh, let me see. Chairperson, give me just one moment so I can count the number of attendees. Eureka Day is also on. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Great. With that, we're going to go to public comment. And we have one member of the public who would like to speak. Our first speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when it is brought up and you begin speaking. OK, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Largent. I was uh, handing out uh, water 
Um, I, I do this a lot on hot days in the uh, getaway van. Uh, got a couple of ice chests, figured out where the county would supply free water, bring the van out there, fill it up. Um, it's like handing out $100 bills. And people are very thirsty because uh, we did shut off the water for the mentally ill homeless in Santa Clara County. Um, uh, one of the spots that I hit up is on the side of City Hall right there. There's some people that really, really need some help. And they rotate back and forth from the reentry network and the public defender's office. Uh, they go in there asking for services that they'll never be able to get. Um, some of these people are not currently um, in the criminal justice system. They're not in that dragnet. So the reentry center, of course, turns them away because they haven't been released from jail within the last year. Uh, it, it was disturbing to see how many homeless people were in line. And the, although the deputy was nice about everything, he just kept saying these people can't be in line. They can't have these services. They need to go. Um, I have noticed that you guys keep putting up more barbed wire, more fences uh, at that old city hall location. Um, I've noticed now you put security lighting out in front of there. Um, I noticed that you illegally swept encampments that were there that should not be done during a pandemic. Um, it's just very disturbing that we sink all this money into all this stuff to keep these people away. Um, I don't know who the genius is that decided to put a passcode on the men's room and the women's room at the sheriff's department. Um, that is a lifeline for people not to have to defecate bags or urinate on the side of uh, buildings. Um, when you guys are out doing your walks, maybe pay attention to the lower sections of buildings. Um, that is urine, that is feces, and that's what people have to utilize. Um, that is the only uh, other restroom after five o'clock. And the current one that's in the county building is a death incubator. There's one toilet in there. You can't socially distance. And um, you guys don't experience that because you have passcodes for your bathrooms, but that's just what the general public has to experience. So thank you. That concludes our speakers, Madam Chair. We're gonna go to our consent calendar, which is really just our minutes, which is item number nine. And I'm sorry, we have to do a roll call vote on this. So any, may I get a motion for the consent calendar? So moved. Thank you. It was moved by Miguel Marquez, seconded by, I'll second. by Molly O'Neill. And um, we'll do a roll call vote. All right. Member Chavez? Member yes. Chavez? Member Smith? Member Smith. Aye. Member Wapensky? Yes. Member Garnett? Um, abstain. I was not at the last meeting. Thank you. Member McClinton Brown. <laughs> Member Esparza. Member Esparza. We'll come back. Member O'Neill. Molly O'Neill. Yes. Member Nikolai. Yes. Member Terrell. Yes. Member Mills. Yes. Member Olmos. Abstain. Abstain. Member Gaxiola. Aye. Member Fisk. Yes. Member Marquez. Yes. Member Aaron O'Brien. Yes. Member Amador Lebeau. Yes. Member Hernandez. Member Hernandez. Abstain. Abstain. Thank you. Member Day. Yes. Member Crocker Cook. Yes. Member Vigeni. Yes. Member Tyndall. Yes. Member Halcon. Yes. Member Amanda Clifford. Yes. Member Kendrick. Yes. And once more for Member Esparza. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we're going to go to item four, and this is to receive a report from the Office of the County Executive relating to pre the pre-arraignment representation and review team's rapid presentation pilot program. There are a lot of folks who are gonna be participating in this presentation, and I'm gonna ask Miguel uh, if he could get us kicked off. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, and good afternoon, Supervisor and members of the Reentry Network. Uh, today, we are uh, providing you with an update on a pilot program, the rapid representation pilot program. It's an ongoing effort to document uh, workflow and analyze data. This work is critical to ensuring that we make data-driven decisions uh, so we can identify and develop in, uh, efficiencies that are intended to better serve our clients and better deploy uh, scarce county resources. 
We have a number of presenters on this item and additional partners who are all gonna be available on the call to answer if, if, uh, any questions you may have. Uh, if I can go to slide two. Um, this year, the county launched the pilot of the pre-arraignment representation and review team. We call it the PAR team. It includes the district attorney's office, <coughs> excuse me, the public defender's office and the office of pretrial services. Recently, uh, we're fortunate to have included more data requirements incorporated into what we're doing. And so it's, uh, I'm pleased to announce that we also now have technology services and solutions department. We call it TSS and they are now an important partner in this effort. This group has done a tremendous job, um, especially being nimble in order to respond to the many challenges we're facing with uh, COVID-19. Um, and we were able to pivot to virtual meetings uh, with clients pre-arraignment once they're housed, which is um, significant. Um, the pilot program for rapid representation presented at the September meeting uh, represented a new concept for how to provide access to legal representation during booking. Prior to an arrestee being housed, when their family is making decisions on whether or not to post bail. This has the potential to provide the court with a more complete picture of an individual circumstances that can inform release decisions prior to arraignment uh, and would result in having releases happen sooner. So now uh, with that uh, brief introduction, let me turn the presentation over to Charlie Hendrickson from the Public Defender's Office. Charlie? Thank you, uh, Miguel. Good afternoon, Supervisor Chavez and all members. Um, this is really to provide, I think, an update of where we're at in the process of providing for the first time uh, in our county um, representation to persons arrested immediately after booking and before arraignment. Um, as Mr. Marquez uh, outlined this year, we piloted for the first time a program of providing pre-arraignment representation uh, to people uh, with uh, Carly Ware and Carson White in our office, along with um, an investigator and a social worker in parallel to do that work. Um, that program has been a little bit difficult to implement in during COVID. While it was very successful before COVID, it was modeled primarily on uh, meeting with clients in person at the jail. While we have, uh, through our uh, partners and friends of the sheriff's office and TSFs, been able to um, develop video conferencing with clients once housed, um, the time frames are such that it's been difficult to meet with pre-arraignment clients. So we came up with the idea of doing it immediately following booking and before housing. Uh, and we think this can work quite well. We can utilize existing resources to provide that representation. Um, and while we cannot access every arrestee that is booked before housing, we believe that if we work smart and target peak hours of booking that we can uh, engage many of those folks. So Monday through Friday during normal business hours, we can engage everyone. Although a lot of the busy hours we know are in the evenings, particularly on weekends, and we can target those and staff those. We're hoping about four days with four evenings a week during the busiest hours and hopefully engage a large percentage of people who are uh, arrested, booked, but awaiting housing on those booking charges. I think we can leverage our experience uh, that we have uh, learned from setting up the video conferencing quickly and uh, in response to COVID with the great work again in the Sheriff's Office, Sarah McCarthy from our office, and also TSS as Miguel Marquez noted. Um, we're also working with uh, TSS to develop essentially a uh, electronic signature or DocuSign capability so we can get the necessary consent forms uh, for our clients to engage in representation. Um, I'll turn it over to Matt Fisk, but certainly available for any questions about the program uh, if you have afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, just, uh, boy, there's quite a Yeah, I'm gonna ask if folks can go on mute, maybe that will help. Okay, I think that sounds much better. Good afternoon. I'd like to just briefly emphasize the support that pretrial services um, has for the rapid representation program. We are on site at the jail 24 7 365. 
uh, or so we're willing and able uh, physically and technically to support this effort. Uh, we're especially eager to support it because we believe that it will enable equal and earlier access to informational and really early er and more equal access to justice to tangible information, supportive informational services and supportive client services. Uh, the earlier we can address these matters, the better the rest of the continuum is all, all parties involved really. Uh, the graphic that you see is just uh, a general depiction of some booking time trends. They really change quite a bit uh, based on pre-trial status or post-conviction. Um, also offense or allegation types, even days of the week. But as we do this, we will learn as we go. And like I said, our role will be to support this effort and be there to screen the individuals, to refer them to the public defender's office for all the hours that they're available, uh, update the reports and route that information from the prosecution and defense uh, back to the court when it's appropriate. And even when individuals aren't necessarily released, we'll be much more prepared for the arraignment session uh, to follow. So uh, we also, I'd just like to add, are prepared to track the clients on a client level, on a client load level, like cohorts, and then see how it helps the rest of the continuum, the health, safety, and justice continuum. Thank you. Thank you. So as you've heard, we've we've done a lot of planning work, but there are still some steps that need to occur. And the first of those is really identifying the location and the sheriff's office has been assisting with locating two private areas in the booking area where that can happen. And once that happens, TSS is going to work with us to make sure that we have some consistent coverage so that we're able to deploy the tablets with all of the different um, components that we're looking for. Most um, specifically, this is a new product for us to be able to have DocuSign is our vendor of choice that we're using for electronic signatures so that we can get consent early on so really we can have those that are in booking start to receive um, legal representation if they qualify from the public defender's office. So still some work to be doing, but we're moving ahead and moving as quickly as we can. But in addition to the work that's happening just on this pilot, during COVID-19, the public safety and justice leaders started to meet first weekly, then biweekly and monthly. But some of that work also entailed looking at our workflow, which was presented to the reentry network at the last meeting in September. And as you saw, it's very complicated. There's a lot of steps that are involved and they are a bit entangled. But what this group is working on is really trying to refine that workflow and see if there are some, ident are some areas that we can identify where they're redundant and we may be able to make them more efficient. And as Miguel alluded to earlier, we do have a significant budget issue that we are facing. And so we wanna make sure that as we're moving forward, we're really using data to help us make those decisions. And with the help of TSS, they were able to help us pull together some data to help us start questioning where are those areas where we can tighten up. And so from that large group, we asked for some volunteers to engage in this working group. And the folks that are currently meeting with us weekly are with Independent Defense Council, TSS, pretrial and reentry, and you will hear from them more later on. But I just wanted to make sure that this group is aware that this work is going is ongoing and we're really looking at the data as it's happening. We also compare what was going on pre-COVID to what has been happening now and what we anticipate to be able to see later on. And as we presented at the last meeting, there is a lot of data that we've been go going through and we're starting to whittle it down. So one of the data sets that was presented at the last meeting was the number of bookings. And really looking at the number of bookings, those that remained in custody for three days or less. And as we started to really hone in a little bit more, we decided you know, that number's increasing and that is significant. But one of the areas where we might not be able to take immediate action is the areas of sites. So we chose as a working group that one of the areas to drill down into was really the on views. So that's when a crime has just occurred and they're brought to the jail and they're booked. So as, as you can see here, this is 
for everybody that is booked, you can still see the percentage of the population that remains for that duration. But for the next slide, what this is showing is just when you're looking at those who were in on view and when they stayed in custody for one day or less or two to three days. And those are some key areas that we want to focus on and we want to actually find out of these folks, are they people who are cycling in and out? Are they people who are, are coming in because it is a mental health or behavioral health related issue? And how, how can we speed up that process? We know that it is very timely and very costly to everyone involved to have to go through this. And we know for, for those who are waiting for arraignment, as we talked about earlier, they may be working with their families to try to get money to post bail. So we wanna help drive down these numbers in these two areas, the one day or less and the two to three days. So this is a glimpse for the group to see the areas where we plan to really hone in on. We have a lot of projects that we do want to tackle. We know for sure that we want to be able to look at the list of, as we keep calling them, our frequent flyers, those who are booked on a regular basis and tell their story a little bit more so we can figure out where it was in the system that we could have provided support. And we find this as being the quickest way for us to make an impact because this is the, the stage when the arrestees' lives are a little bit unstable. And if we're wanting them to maintain their jobs, it's important that we get them out of custody and we get them connected to services. And I wanted to have Sylvia, who's also on the line, and Javier weigh in just a little bit kind of from their perspectives, working with clients and working with services, how this data is going to help us moving forward. Good afternoon, uh, Supervisor Chavez and members. Um, I'm Sylvia Perez McDonald with the Independent Defense Council Office and a volunteer for this work group. One of the key um, examples that we could um, illustrate for you all today on how we are uh, working with this data to come up with innovative and creative solutions that will help us make important decisions both safely and uh, reduce costs and improve efficiency. So on this slide that you have before you, you have um, an example of uh, if we look at this data from a race equity lens, so if we look at uh, the population that comes into the front door at the jail that is booked uh, and then released from one to three days, we know that the population that is being impacted by this are the Latinx community, when we have 50.77% of them um, that uh, have this experience. So we know that if we are able to look at the booking process and examine whatever procedures we can improve upon, we could actually have a significant impact on uh, the population that is disproportionately represented in the jail and that we know um, may, be, uh, be may benefit from the practice. Um, as Melody mentioned, if we improve our ability to release them earlier in the process by even a day or two, not only will that impact our costs, but it will actually help improve potential outcomes for this population. And it's important to note that we are able to do this uh, safely because based on the data, as you can see in the chart, we are looking at a population that is charged with very low level offenses and offenses that are driven by common factors such as substance abuse, uh, alcohol-related offenses, and mine, other minor offenses. So if you look at the chart, there's the substance abuse population is 36.9%. The DUI population, which again includes a first offense DUI or even a reckless driving, that is 28.5%. And you look at the other category, which is again, including other minor offenses, that is 72.8% of those booked uh, that were spent one day or less in jail that we could influence and have an impact on. So this uh, really does reflect, and it's just one of the many examples we hope to illustrate down the road on how we can use the data to make really uh, better uh, decisions and improve our policies and our practices. So I'm happy to answer any questions later. And I'll pass it over to Javier, who I think uh, can offer also his perspective. Good afternoon, I'm Javier Aguirre with Office of Reentry Services. So 
what um, one thing that I was tasked was to look at the profile of the clients from one given month. So we looked at September of 2020 and uh, of about 300 plus individuals that were booked in custody and then released within 33 days, we were able to match 78 of those clients in our referral tracking system. So 78 clients um, visited the Reentry Resource Center. Of those 78, uh, most recently 25 came to the center within the last few months. Um, and just a quick, uh, most of them are on general releases, form of probation. Um, the majority of the 78, um, said 46% are literally homeless. Uh, 18% are, tr are transitional um, in housing, hotel or motel. About 27% have no high school or GED and about 56 only have, 56% only have a high school or GED. And then we were also, we asked every client that comes to the center if they've been in the juvenile justice system. And of the 78 individuals, uh, 27 were involved in the juvenile justice system or 35%. So a uh, long history of, of it being in the criminal justice system. So our next step is to look at the type of services they requested and what services were they, did they receive engaged or did our system fail them in terms of enrolling them in a service? So that's gonna be our next um, analysis, um, diving into this data. And I think most importantly too is um, our work is to, in lieu of arrest, how can some of these individuals be diverted to the sobering center um, there at the reentry resource center? So um, as Sylvia mentioned, majority of clients have a substance dependence or a, could have a mental health issue. So the Sobering Center can be an alternative to being booked in jail. Um, and so we are closely working with behavioral health um, law enforcement agency liaisons to work with our, to re-engage police officers and police chiefs on the usage of the Sobering Center. Thank you. So I think with that, uh, is there one more slide? Yeah, I think as you can see, we've been making steady progress on this body of work of note. Uh, you can see we're starting to make really good use of data to quantify where there are bottlenecks in the system that we can address and efficiencies that can be gained. Um, you know, in closing, I'd note that the reentry network and the Public Safety and Justice Committee each challenged us as you know partners in the criminal justice system to think about how we can apply lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic to enact long-term transformational change. Um, and in addition, uh, recent protests have energized the community to challenge us in this same way. Uh, and those challenges are welcome. Uh, we are on our way, uh, well on our way to reimagining a criminal justice system uh, so far based on the data that is available to us and we'll continue to work on additional efforts. There is certainly more work to come and we look forward to providing updates on our continuing efforts to this group uh, and to many others. So thank you. And with that, we're available to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go first to public uh, comment and then I'm gonna come back to the group for discussion. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Scott Largent. A lot of these conversations right now, uh, I, I just think should have been happening a, a very, very, very long time ago. This kind of comes across as like an infomercial, like you guys are trying to sell me something that doesn't work. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of confused. Um, the first line of defense, I thought it was the public defender's office. I thought they were supposed to function like a law office. In a previous life, when I did have an actual real attorney, um, I could get on the horn with them right away when something went wrong. I did the same thing with my business, uh, same thing. Well, I didn't really have much of a criminal past or anything, but um, you go to the right people right away. Uh, public defender's office, when I went in there begging about property, begging about my father's ashes, begging about every goddamn thing that was taken from me, they told me to get water and leave. Then they physically filmed me out in front of there getting slammed on San Jose police cars out in front of the uh, PD. They thought it was funny, okay? A lot of people keep coming in and out of there asking for help, okay? I, I, I understand what you guys are trying to pull off here right now, 
Um, I don't see success stories. I don't see results. I'm going to keep saying it. I, I, I'm not seeing this. I'm seeing so many people suffer. And I'll tell you something. Right now, the get out of jail free card is pull the mental health card. OK, because they just pull the wool right over your eyes, Judge Manley. And that's how people get back out on the streets to get high. And if I was still using, oh, my God, it would be a free for all. You can continue to break the law nonstop and just get manly and keep cycling in and out of that stuff. These people are meth addicts. They're not mostly mentally ill. You guys make the money off the fact they're mentally ill. You excessively bill them through Valley Medical. I understand how it works. And, and it's disgusting. Get out there and start helping these people right now. They're defecating and dying on the side of your buildings. I'm sick of saying this so much. All you guys do is put in more barbed wire, more passcodes, more cages, more help. That concludes our public speakers. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to uh, Maya. That's for a sec. Thank you. Um, that was a really helpful presentation. Um, so that analysis, um, am I correct? So that's 53% of the population booked from January 1st, 2019 to May 31st, 2020, right? That's and 42 correct. For those, correct. For those that were booked, for those that were released, that were booked and released within three days. That and 42% spending one day or less in custody, right? Yes. Okay. And then I had another question. Some I was trying to capture all the um, information in, in the graph. And then um, I think Javier, you you mentioned a percentage that were homeless. Was that thirty eight percent? So uh, we looked at uh, out of the three ninety eight individuals in one month, we were only able to identify seventy eight of those clients that came to the reentry resource center. And of those 78, um, 36 individuals or 46% identify themselves or in the registration as literally homeless. Okay. So majority of our clients that come to the reentry center are homeless. Okay, that was helpful. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I, I had a question on the 36.9% of substance dependence. Could somebody speak to that? So just so that we are clear that the initial evaluation that we're doing at this point is very preliminary. So this is just our first uh, examination of the data. And with the example I provided is the first sort of example of what we're trying to do. The first examination is just the initial analysis and then there's the drill down. What Javier mentioned was our first attempt at the drill down and the deeper dive into the data. That's why we only took one month. That number was shared with Javier and Javier was then able to drill down on those numbers just a bit. I think the substance abuse, the 36.9% is just one example of another category of cases that we could do a deeper dive and a greater dive into them. Like who are they? Uh, what, what is their exact defense type? Uh, and other factors that we could sort of make decisions on. But for now, all that, all that we know is that those are people that made it into the front door of the jail with a substance abuse offense, misdemeanor, and they were released almost, you know, obviously within three days. So based on, those are the only things that we know so far. But that alone is powerful because it's mm -hmm. telling us that, that it's an opportunity for us to, for example, work with law enforcement so that law enforcement is aware of the, a sobering center or is aware of other options that they have instead of just dropping them off in the front door of the jail uh, because we know that's not that's not helping anyone right so th that's just another category and it's another example of additional work that we're going to be doing thank you and i'm very very interested in that further analysis i think it would be really helpful because i i i mean we're seeing i represent district seven in san jose and so uh, just anecdotally, I'm personally seeing a lot of um, intersection in homelessness and substance abuse, and you'll hear more from the city later um, on that. And um, I think one of my questions also, because I, I found that number astounding, as maybe because maybe I'm not, I don't live in this as much as you, but 
what I'm interested also is hearing, uh, Sherry, are you, um, is behavioral health then prepared to make those linkages for programs um, so that folks, maybe if they are arrested, and uh, I don't know, maybe we can hear from Chief Tyndall, I'm not sure what people are arrested, what substance dependence is um, in terms of what they're being arrested for, but are we prepared to create those linkages in the behavioral health system for folks to get that kind of assistance? Uh, yes, I mean, I think to Javier's point, um, this data is really helpful because if we can uh, figure out how to divert um, individuals via law enforcement to the sobering center, um, it would be an opportunity to link them much sooner to uh, services that could then help address um, whatever the concern is, whether it be mental health and or substance use. So um, once we're able to, um, you know, identify and uh, connect with individuals that are experiencing these challenges, we can definitely get them connected to services. And so how does the sobering center work? I know this has come up a few times before, but so I represent like Coyote Creek, I represent Monterey Road, we have a lot of heavy outreach in these areas. And let's say somebody is taken in, um, they're, uh, they've taken some meth, um, there have been calls, complaints, or something else. And then in that state of mind, somebody gets dropped off at the sobering center instead of going to jail. And then what happens at the sobering center? Javier, do you want to address that? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, in that in that scenario, yeah. right? Yep. Where which trust me happens sure. all the time in, in the neighborhoods is right. somebody's in that state of mind um, and uh, you know, and then they're taken in. What happens for them at the sobering center? So just one step back. So the law the officer on the field can call the sobering center and they could identify who the client is and whether they're eligible. If they meet the eligibility criteria, then they have two options. They could have the sobering center meet them in the field to pick up the individual, or the officer can bring them to the sobering center. The officer drops them off with, and is out by the door within five minutes, no more than five minutes. Then the, then the staff that is at the sobering center is Horizons. So they're part of the behavioral health system of care. So they provide substance use and mental health services. So there's a medical staff and clinical staff there the individual can stay up to 23 hours and 59 minutes. Um, we'll sober up, they have an opportunity to take a shower, get a new set of clothes, have a few uh, food, and then they could start engaging them. The most important thing is to enroll them in the whole person care. So then um, they could start uh, leveraging services. With Horizons being our provider, they can also see if they've been part of their system. So if they need further detox, they have five detox bed in the community that they could then literally transport them from the sobering center to their detox center. If they need other mental health services, they'll work with behavioral health to make the linkage. If they're there during the business hours that the, the reentry center is open, they could then walk them over to the reentry center. We have a medical mobile unit to assist them. So um, again, it is probably the best way to divert individuals. And we're just making it as simple as possible for law enforcement officers, instead of waiting 45 minutes to an hour in the jail to book someone because of all the different mental health screenings, uh, no more than five minutes in and out and dropping off the individual. So I will yeah. add that one critical factor, uh, that one critical uh, aspect of this that we uh, will need to do more work on, and it's great to see law enforcement members uh, represented here because part of our job here is going to take it a bit, a bit further and see from law enforcement perspective um, what they need, what information they need to have so that to the extent that it's possible for them to start utilizing that alternative more than they are relying on the jail. And we will need to hear them out. We will need to provide maybe additional information about what's available uh, and then uh, I identify that gap. If it exists, fill it, and then identify other uh, either issues or resources or whatever it is they need that will make them feel more comfortable to utilize this other alternative. Because at the bottom, 
At the end of the day, we recognize law enforcement's desire to address a critical and immediate need to remove a person from the situation or circumstance that has caused the police to answer the call and bring them into the front door at the jail. We also wanna educate law enforcement that, that the bringing them into the jail and, and allowing the taxpayers to pay uh, all that it costs for the booking process and the bed space for three days hasn't resolved the issue. And that we, we want a better alternative and we wanna create uh, an avenue for them to resort to the best and better alternative rather than resorting to the one size fits all, bring them into jail. Thank you. And, um, and Javier, uh, so you said if they do qualify for the sobering center, what happens if they don't qualify for the sobering center and what are the um, qualifications? So I think that? one disqualification is that there uh, um, exhibits some violence. And, and of course, it's the, the law enforcement officer will be making their judgment in terms of is it safe to bring someone to the sobering center to a place that civilians are providing the service. Um, and, you know, um, a lot of individuals may have been under the influence of some drugs, but they're not exhibiting that behavior until they arrive at the center. Um, we're very fortunate that um, the, the center is part of the county civic center. So the sheriff can then, um, if there's a, an immediate need for an emergency, they will call the sheriff and the, the deputies will, will provide that. Um, um, uh, security measures. Um, rarely do we turn people away. Um, it's only that they're exhibiting some type of violence or they're a 5150, meaning that they've identified that they uh, want to harm themselves, then law enforcement officers will probably take them to EPS. Okay, thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Chief Tyndall and then to Rose. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the presentation today. So a couple of quick questions, and then I actually do some questions about the, uh, the ability to divert. Um, so in the presentation itself, it was listing, uh, was it 36.9% in substance abuse, and then there was a 20-something percent range in DUI. A uh, question I had is, in regards to these, are these standalone, let's say, simple um, under the influence, simple possession, simple DUIs? or the percentages that we're talking about, did those also incorporate other charges? And are, is there a possibility that some of those charges are a little more, uh, are, are a higher level, or is that the highest level there is on it? This is based on our CJIC data, so it is using the hierarchy. So that is just reflecting the highest charge. There may be some lower ones, but that wouldn't be incorporated into this. Okay, and I think you also, but as a follow-up, so we would do a drill down of that, that those numbers and then identify which one of those would be standalone charges and which one would be much more complex. Okay. And I think that goes into the next question because we would absolutely, um, I, I think in regards to the sobering station, the utilization of that, the ability to divert on many different instances, I think oftentimes that we find, and I can speak for San Jose only in this case, um, a lot of our either uh, under the influence or somebody having a, uh, a, men a mental distress and or alcohol dependency. A lot of times when we get called and when we do book, um, it is somebody who is potentially violent or somebody who could potentially be under a 5150 um, or close to it, but yet uh, there may be some criminal charges involved with it that we can't take them to EPS uh, right off the bat. So I think uh, just in that regard, a lot of times for us to divert, um, we will need a bridge um, because we certainly know that it's non-custodial once we drop them off the sobering station. Uh, and the last thing we want to do is have somebody just turn around, walk away and go back in the community again. Um, so I think that's for us is kind of one of those things that um, I certainly think there's wiggle room. Um, I certainly think our officers would prefer to go to the sobering station than to either get it, uh, getting somebody medically cleared or take them down a lower booking and go through that process. Uh, if there's ability to do it, that was somewhere in between non-custodial and or the ability to bring somebody uh, who, you know, potentially could be exhibiting violence while they're high or, you know, on alcohol. Dave, what would, an, what would a meaning a bridge, meaning a broader bandwidth of flexibility and then maybe a, a, a broader ability for us to handle someone who 
for lack of a better word, may not be violent, but isn't passive, like something in, in between. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think there's there's many times that we bring somebody in that, let's say, our initial call, they were exhibiting violence. They uh -huh. may have been violent towards police, um, but it may just be one of those things where truly the charge is, you know, a 647F, a drunk in public or a, a stimulant influence. And really, they're being violent because they're drunk or because they're under the influence. And a lot of times it's kind of like our old, you know, our old sobering station, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, the ability to have somebody at least sleep it off um, in a little more of a setting that could be a little more controlled yeah. uh, would be helpful versus drop them off. And then, you know, they either get violent with uh, sobering center staff or just turn around and walk out the door. Dave, what's really interesting about that is the last discussion we're going to have is about the rebuild of the jail. And one of the, one of the, um, opportunities I think we have is to restructure the reentry center, literally restructure it, physically restructure it to be able to be more, um, to have more options. And so I appreciate you raising it. Like the timing of what you've raised is really great. So thank you for that. And I'll also just say, Dave, that early on when we reestablished the sobering center, um, in part it was based on um, discussions we were having with San Jose PD about um, about a, a lower level uh, person, but recognizing recognizing that we're really trying to think about interventions. I, I appreciate the point you're raising because we because our our partners that are assisting with with assisting us with these some of them who are with us today. I I think we're all trying to figure out how much flexibility is is there in our system to respond to the needs that we really have versus. I think where we started. So anyway, so thanks for that. Uh, Rose? Yeah, it's for Javier. Uh, so does a sobering station take DUIs as well or just drunk in public or exactly what do they say? No, yes. Yeah, so currently the criteria is uh, for those that are DUI, the officers will take them, uh, will book them in jail. So they basically will take drunk in public, is that? they take yes. the sobering station? Correct. So those that are publicly intoxicated, an individual exhibiting a mental health crisis or um, some form of having influence under some form of drugs. So um, as Supervisor Chavez indicated, we also heard from um, the San Jose Police Department that they also wanted to expand the criteria from public intoxication to drugs and mental health. So we added those triage components uh, earlier this year. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions on this area? Um, just, I wanted to make uh, two requests to staff. One is thank you for the presentation. And I realize you're moving a new program during COVID and it both creates opportunities, but you know, not at the same time. So thank you for that work. Um, two things that I would really be interested in getting an update on. Um, one, and we could do this, uh, you know, through committee if it's necessary. I, I am interested in how quickly we get that interview room situation set up. And then second, uh, Miguel, I, I am, I think we might have to have um, a conversation with, uh, with TSS about how to um, make sure that we get Wi-Fi, you know, where we need it. Because I, I recognize that that's an ongoing problem, but my understanding is that as we're using the um, iPads that we're gonna need to really boost Wi-Fi in the, um, in the booking area. So I, I just think it'd be good if someone could reach out to Emory and get an, an estimate on the timing of that. I, I can look into that. I think it might involve facilities and fleet too, but I'll take care of that and get an I'll estimate. Say, don't make me go put day. a little sledgehammer in one of those walls. No. So <laughs> whatever it okay. takes. I'll, I'll right. look into it. Um, so, okay, great. Well, thank you for, for all of that uh, really good work. And let's, um, if we could in the next few weeks, just get an update on the room and the, you know, the, the interviewing. And, um, and then the other thing, just as a side note, um, Javier, it might be interesting at our next meeting, just to do an update on, on um, what we are providing at the reentry center. And, and uh, you know, more because I think this group, you guys have in a really good way been starting to respond on the ground and growing a little more organically in terms of service provision. But the point that um, that um, that Maya raised about the 
the linkages, because I know that's always been a challenge for us, but how we're making those linkages between us and then the other service providers, I think is something that would be worth us just being very concrete about how that's happening. And then where we're seeing that we still have a need, for example, where we still have to wait to get somebody into um, detox or into, um, uh, into a program. And, and part of the reason is it actually speaks to the point that Dave raised too, which is that some of our programs won't take somebody if they think they're going to be um, hard, hard to handle. And I, again, that's where we, if, if the only option is a jail, then I still think we need to think about that third way, which is why I think being able to figure out or not figure out, because I know you guys are doing this, but where the linkage works, where it doesn't, and then who falls out of the categories, because that's really what our next gen of work is going to be. Okay, Sherry, absolutely, that, we could provide that. Okay. Sherry, is that all right with you too? Yes. Great. I'm sorry, I was looking around at my Hollywood Squares, I couldn't see you. I mean, Thank the you. other thing I think that could be, that we could look at and Javier and I have been discussing is, you know, EPS often refers to the sobering center. So individuals that are being dropped there are going in for 5150, but actually, inappropriately placed um it's actually due to intoxication so i think that's another thing that we need to look at is the path that we're taking around individual need and, and how um uh, um to officer tyndall's uh comment how can we think about this intermediary situation where um, individuals may not be maybe presenting in different ways and they're landing in different spots, but mm -hmm. truly they may be able to benefit from services through the sobering center, so. Well, and it actually speaks to the last item we're gonna talk about is the jail today and what happened at the board meeting yesterday. Cause part of what I, and, I, and, and I'm really glad we have um, so many of our uh, public safety partners because I actually think this is an opportunity for us to discuss both what the board was saying and what are the implications in terms of options. Because I think, Sherry, you raise a great point, which is we sometimes send people from EPS to jail. Right. I mean, we, you know, that's, that's a, that, that means the system's not working, right? All right. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. That was really, really informative. So we're going to go to, on to item five. And this is um, uh, executive county exec's report relating to the best approach and process regarding the use of the criminal justice system mobile application. And I'm not sure who's presenting on this, but I'm gonna to turn to... Hi, good afternoon. This is oh. Janae Fortier from the County Exec's Office. Welcome. I am very glad to be back with you all. Um, so in February, the Reentry Network received a report with information regarding the use of mobile applications um, by our criminal justice partners. So I wanted to give you a brief, oops. At that time, um, pretrial services was the only one with an app and the remaining agencies were, um, were in stages ranging from interested in to the beginnings of development. And just a quick reminder that when we surveyed the agencies at that time on what specific features they would like, they, they very much mirrored the pretrial services app. And folks are looking for calendars, alerts and reminders, two-way communication, um, et cetera. So uh, over the last couple of months, there's actually been a, quite a bit of movement um, for some of the agencies, um, perhaps very timely considering our move to a, a very tech heavy service at this point. So reentry services has submitted um, a project request to TSS. So they're still waiting to hear back on in order to, to move forward with development. But probation has continued to roll out the um, their new case management system called PRISM, which stands for Probation Records Information Systems Manager. So um, they were able to work with their vendor at that time to go ahead and include a, a client portal, which was approved and funded and currently in design. PRISM is ex expected to be completed by mid-2021. The Public Defender's Office has continued to work with Stanford University um, and the Bail Project. They're specifically working um, on an app to communicate with clients and automatically send text message court reminders. So um, 
The PDO continues to work with Stanford. They expect to go live with court reminders in December, and there'll be a phased rollout of the custom AI text messaging system and the offering of Lyft rides for select clients in the months to follow. Um, and, and they anticipate having a, um, eventually having two-way text messaging capability. And then the district attorney's office, uh, the victim services unit, was able to secure a grant award in order to fund uh, and implement a, um, uh, an, an app for their purposes. So they've been working with TSS on testing a mock-up over the next couple of weeks and developing an admin module so that they'll have greater control over adding clients in the future. Once they provide feedback and finalize any changes, it will go into development and they anticipate continuing to work with TSS on routine maintenance and any costs um, that, that, that would entail the maintenance of that application. I will pause there to see if any of our partner agencies would like to add anything else at this time. Okay, great. Then um, uh, just in closing, I would say that we would re our recommendations um, are why is they're slightly different at this point since everyone's been doing some really great work independently and moving forward. Um, we expect ORS to continue to work with TSS, the Office of Reentry Services, to work with technology services and solutions on, on the development of their app. Um, same for probation and um, the Public Defender's Office and the DA's Office. And um, we are looking forward to some interesting data to come out of all of these new systems to see how they um, impact the specific outcomes for each of those different populations. And I will end there. Um, all right, we don't have any public speakers on this item. So I'm gonna go to our panelists and start with Pablo. Um, good afternoon, guys. Uh, just really quick, I would like to ask, um, so I saw that we did some um, surveying and some questions for department agencies. Has there been any, any plan on servicing or, or surveying um, the, the clients themselves to see what- People work done with clients because I think otherwise all my lamenting is for naught. So if we could get a report back just on for each app, what's the client participation and end user is really what I mean by that. All right, so we're gonna go on to item six. And this is to receive a verbal report from the City of San Jose's Housing Department related to SOAR, Service Outreach Assistance and Resources Homeless Encampment Outreach Program. And with that, I'm turning it over to Council Member Esparza. Uh, thank you. Um, we uh, today, so we have Reagan Henninger um, who will be presenting on the City's Services Outreach Assistance and Resources Outreach Team We've been um, taking feedback from uh, lived experience, neighborhoods, um, and trying to figure out a new way of reaching out and uh, connecting people to services to really address some of the underlying problems. Thank you, Reagan. Thanks, Council Member Sparza, and thank you uh, so much for having me here today. I'm the City of San Jose's uh, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. And um, one of the gifts of COVID, is, if there are any, is uh, some infusion of federal dollars, federal stimulus dollars. And with that, the City of San Jose will be starting a new uh, street-based services program called SOAR. Services Outreach Assistance and Resources. And it's, we are using some federal emergency solutions grant funding. And the program is really focused on the city of San Jose's uh, 16 largest homeless encampments. And there are three primary components of the program, uh, which are street outreach and services, hygiene and infection control and shelter and housing solutions. So for street outreach and support services, we will have dedicated street outreach teams with contracted service providers, PATH and Home First, who will be focused day in and day out on doing work in these 16 encampments. 
these teams will be staffed by clinicians, harm reduction specialists, and folks with lived experience. We'll also have a street-based storage program, which is something we heard again and again um, from folks with lived experience. And then one of the things we've been doing during COVID, which we're proposing to lean in uh, even more, is we've been working with the community and groups of advocates to provide um, supplies when community groups are doing their own outreach and work in encampments. We've been providing PPE and hand sanitizer and garbage bags and solar phone chargers. And so we're proposing to continue to do that um, and to enhance that work even more. The second component is hygiene and infection control. So uh, back in March, we deployed porta potties and hand washing stations to encampments. We will continue that, but um, enhance it even more. We know there are some locations who need um, more than what we currently have in place. Uh, we'll be providing uh, mobile laundry with our partner Dignity on Wheels. We paid for a second shower trailer for them. And we've also paid for a new trailer, which is, um, uh, it's called Hope Health Mobile. It's a mobile rest stop where people can charge their cell phone. They can uh, speak remotely with doctors from Stanford and there's some light case management available. We've been working with VHHP to do testing in encampments of 10 or more, and we uh, definitely want to continue to do that. And then the other component is providing a comprehensive uh, level of trash uh, service and large item debris removal. And that's really on a, a more consistent basis than we have been doing. And then the third component is shelter and housing opportunities. And this is where the bulk of the money um, from our ESG grant will go to. We have some reserved shelter beds at uh, South Hall, which is a shelter we started operating back in March when COVID first began, but we will plan to continue operations uh, of that shelter at least through April. We will be starting a new motel voucher program um, for folks because we know uh, sometimes shelter is not the best option for someone, either physically or emotionally. And so these outreach teams will have um, both the motel vouchers and the shelter beds sort of in their uh, toolbox of tools to use as they're working in these encampments. And we've also uh, have put some money aside to do what we call housing problem solving, which is really diverting people from shelter with some financial assistance and some light case management to find other immediate housing opportunities, whether that's um, a potential opportunity to move in with a friend or family member. And so those are really the three main components. We anticipate this program will start um, in January of this coming year. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share um, a little bit more about this program. Thank you. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go um, hear public comment, and then we'll come back to the panel for discussion. So I'd ask the clerk to call our public speakers. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I enjoyed listening to um, some of the report. I, I, uh, my concern is that no one is taking the time to vet out people um, that are in encampments. Uh, as an example, uh, the big one that's kind of blossomed out near Spring Street near our crash zone there. I, I don't understand how we can mix people that have been sober for a long time with people that are schizophrenic and smoking meth, um, people that have massive criminal records to people that don't have any criminal records at all. Um, I, I don't know why we just cram everybody together and throw them out there on Temptation Island just to fight for themselves. I, I don't understand it. I, I think that's a big factor why the, why the rug is being pulled out from underneath that Milpitas uh, extended stay. 
you guys didn't take the time to, uh, you know, that those things are really rolling out now with getting hotels and getting places for people to go. Uh, best foot forward. You want to make it look right in the beginning. OK, you should have put a bunch of people in recovery in there, families, women with kids, you know, uh, the best of the best that are pretty much out there on the streets. And that would have been great. Um, I don't know why we're not doing anything like that. Uh, sanctioned encampments right now, I really do think are our last opportunity. Uh, we have to start doing something. Uh, please, please go for a walk. Go out the front of the county building, turn left. I mean, you guys rotate around that thing nonstop on our dime anyway. Go a little farther down the street, okay? Go see what it's really like. Watch the structures that are being built. Watch, I mean, it, it is, uh, it, it's amazing that nobody has just kind of stepped in and said, hey, let me help you uh, make a better plan. Let me help you put that trailer in the right spot. Uh, let me help you cook food properly without burning down half of the uh, creek. Uh, these are things that are shocking. So, thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Aguirre. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, Robert Aguirre. Um, I, I, I'd like to talk to what Dr. Tyler just said right now and changing uh, that uh, many times and uh, for a reason I don't really understand. Hey, Robert. Robert, we're having a very hard time hearing you. Do you want to? Do you want to? Um, maybe try again. Is this? Is this better? Yes. Keep going. All right. All right. Okay. Can I start again? Then? Actually, not better. Sorry. Not better. Oh. Okay. How about now? Is this getting better? When you said, "Oh, okay." I'm, I'm inside. Okay. Okay, how about now? Yes. Just, okay, all right, I'll do it in this position. So if you please give me another 30 seconds on the clock, I'd appreciate it. All right, thank you. Uh, so what I was saying again was that I wanna echo uh, the, the sentiments of uh, Scott Argent. I'd also like to say, I put an emphasis on sanctioning campus, something that has been discussed many times and has never really been implemented. They were willing to do so uh, at Hope Village, and uh, that whole project was just, uh, abandoned. And I think just one seem to have okay. lost him madam chair he may be disconnected thank you sorry about um, that um well we can track him back to him one more time um our next speaker is carolyn morellis sailor i am unmuting you please accept the unmute you will have two minutes to speak the timer will start when you begin speaking thank you good afternoon everyone my name is carolyn Mireles sailor i'm the new program uh director of uh, the day worker center at conexion to community and um, for those of you that do not know, um, we are open seven days a week from seven in the morning to two o'clock in the afternoon. We provide uh, free meals for our, uh, our clients. Um, we do have um, calls that come in for uh, mainly homeowners that want something done at their homes, uh, repairs, um, uh, landscaping. Uh, we do have uh, skilled um, videos to show them how to um, fix minor things. We are going to start uh, some type of training. Um, we're going to have someone, uh, a skilled worker, come in and teach them just uh, minor things. Um, hopefully by the end of uh, November. Um, so I would like to invite anyone, if you that are in the area of Story and um, Santa Road, to to drop by, and I'd gladly give you the tour of not only of our daily worker center, but also of the rest of our facility. And we are um, six uh, feet distance. Um, also, uh, mass sanitizing and uh, washing your hands. Thank you. Thank you. We'll We're going to go. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Did you want to try Robert one more time? Sure. Okay. Robert, I'm unmuting you. Let's see if you have better reception. You have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay. Is this any better? Can you hear me better now? No, not really, Robert. Sorry. Uh, 
All right. That concludes so, our speakers. Thank you. I'm going to go to um, see if there are any of my colleagues who would like to speak, and I'll start with Councilmember Esparza. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, one of the reasons why we requested that this presentation come before the reentry committee is so that we could have better linkages between the city investing more in our outreach teams and investing more to create these linkages and to see how we could work better and more closely with the county on the other end. And so um, I just wanted to ask uh, who uh, SOAR should be working with as they continue to work on the planning and the execution um, of this enhanced outreach service team. I think it would be really beneficial to all of us. Reagan, are you already working with uh, Consuelo? We are working with Consuelo. I think um, what would be great to have is a, also a direct connection with behavioral health so that the uh, clinicians and harm reduction specialists on the SOAR outreach team can um, make those linkages. So um, I'll ask Consuelo to do that with you because um, they're all in the same department and uh, that's probably the most direct way to go. So I know Sherry's here, but I think that's more Consuelo and her colleagues uh, level. So thank you for that. Um, Rose? Yeah, thank you. I just want to add on to what Caroline said. Um, we do have a lot of homeless that come into the day worker center. Through the whole pandemic, we've been feeding hot meals. So even if they're not going out to work, we will feed people, we will give a bad lunch to take with them. If it gets filled with day workers, then we'll just give a meal to go, you know. But we do have showers, we have um, a washer and dryers for clothes. So there is that facility there that people could be using and we are on the corner of uh, Story right there by Center and across from the creek. So a lot of our, even our day workers, the clients live in the creek or they are homeless, but they, they come in take a shower, eat a meal, and then they get sent out to work and they have enough money to buy food or whatever they need. I mean, as I say, we feed them so they don't have to have the first two meals, but that resource is available. Thank you, Damon. Um, Reagan, I'm not sure if you've met up. I'm Damon Silver, I'm from the Public Defender's Office and I'm the administrator associated with our uh, outreach uh, and post-conviction team. Um, I'm not sure if you've had any coordination with Ashanti Mitchell, our community outreach um, attorney, or our other members of our post-conviction team who have been doing outreach, uh, direct outreach into the homeless community since, uh, since the pandemic began. Uh, but we would certainly, I know we have been on a series of, of what had started as weekly calls um, and also trying to coordinate with the city, but we would certainly be natural partners with you um, from the county perspective and uh, would be happy to, to, to meet up. I think they have a lot, uh, the team has a lot of ideas. They have a fair number of connections um, and really appreciate your uh, presentation talking about specific needs in terms of uh, trash removal, access to hygiene, all of those, all those issues. So we would be happy to partner. The last comment I would make is that this uh, also came up, I believe in a recent a public safety and justice committee meeting that um, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg chairs and this idea of potentially a partnership strike team of outreach members that includes uh, public health, includes potentially members of the public defender's office um, and other reentry resources so that when we go out, we are serving um, kind of all the criminogenic needs that a client may face, both kind of immediate needs in terms of housing, food, but also if they've got bench warrants, if they've got substance abuse needs, how do, we, how do we basically meet them out in the community and provide those services to them directly as a team? So uh, feel free, I can reach out to you or you can reach out to me and we'll definitely get, to, get each other hooked up together. Thanks. Yeah, and we, can, and we can get Maya to do some connections too, who's listening. Molly? Thank you, Reagan, thank you for that uh, great report. And I was really pleased to hear as Damon just mentioned that you're including garbage pickup because that's the number one thing we hear when we're out is we just could really use some help getting garbage picked up but i had a question um related to one of your slide bullet points uh which was 
that you provide some light case management. And I wondered if you could say a little more about that. I I um I, I know case management is critical and it, it it's not a one shot thing. You have to build a relationship and figure out the needs. And so uh, maybe we need more than light case management, but can you explain what that is in this context? Yeah, so, so our street outreach teams are, will be doing intensive work in the 16 encampments that we've identified. So, you know, we know that you have better results if you're connecting with someone day in and day out. How are you doing today? You know, um, and so that's really what PATH and Home First will be doing. It's their job to be in these encampments every day with folks. The light case management that I mentioned was part of Dignity on Wheels the mobile shower service. So when you use their service, there is um, some light case management and service connections available. So if you're there and you're waiting for your laundry to finish drying, they can also make connections for you to other types of services. So um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, Regan is, is do is most of the resource being used for this? Is it because um, you 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 said something about federal dollars? Was the federal dollars in reference to the housing or to the program overall? So the program overall is being funded by uh, ESG fund. Thank you, mm -hmm. um, Consuelo. If you could um, do a convening that includes behavioral health and also Damon, that would be great. I mean, with uh, Molly's team and Damon's team. Um, also, so we could just do one kind of county um, sync up would be great. Yes, absolutely. Health. Okay, thanks a bunch. Thank, thank you, you both. Maya, thanks for bringing that. And Reagan, thank you for your presentation. That's very exciting work. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to our last item on the agenda, and this is to receive a report about the new jail replacement facility for Main Jail Ooh. South. And um, for those of you who were listening to the board um, yesterday, the board made a decision to essentially, um, essentially to, to put a pause on the new jail. That's the way I'm gonna describe it. And the board had a lot of different reasons for um, wanting to do this. Um, my, Martha, not to put you on the spot, but um, I'm interested in your perspective on what happened. And then as a board member, I'll give you my perspective. And then we're really interested in hearing from all of you. So Martha, do you want to, should I dare you, should, should you start? Go ahead. <laughs> sure. No, it was, um, the in, original intent was to report back at a couple of referrals, both from supervisors Cortese and Chavez, um, on what some options might be. And so, you know, to your question, supervisor, I didn't expect, um, what, we, what I saw was a comprehensive public input um, as well as a robust discussion among the board members. And so we were still, as a team, we were still distilling it yesterday after the meeting and today as well. So, you know, that said, I can kind of go over the, the, the pieces of what the board is asking us to bring back, but that was my initial impression. It was, um, there's a lot of public discussion. Yeah, go ahead, Martha, just maybe some key headlines there, and then I'll make some observations and then we could just get hear from folks. Yeah, just to, uh, we just wanted to still what the board's discussion was really briefly. Um, so what, what, what we um, kind of distilled down from the discussion is administration is going to be reviewing LA County's main central replacement facility effort and assessing the feasibility of having clinicians run a facility staffed with clinicians and, and possibly correctional deputies. And so we'll, be, we'll also be providing data on jail population, both past numbers and future projections for a variety of categories, um, such as where people are housed with mental, uh, mental health diagnoses in, in jail, and also evaluate the reduced jail population since COVID to see if there's an impact on building a new jail. Um, also, we were directed to, you know, before we take any more action on any RFPs or building a new jail, we'll be going back to the board for approval. And we'll also be looking at the impact of the two federal consent decrees on whether or not we build a new jail. The board also discussed getting a comprehensive review of all the options for all the existing spaces at Main Jail in Elmwood with a focus on 
feasibility and desirability of the options. And then also possibly looking at something between a jail um, and a facility that's being built out at, at VMC for behavioral health needs. Maybe looking at a facility that allows for people to be incarcerated but still work that aligns with the goals of our future public safety and justice center, um, as well as the reentry and no entry center. And on a final note, uh, we're going to be taking a look at all these things from the board discussion yesterday and bringing back a comprehensive report to the board on November 17th. So supervisor, I hope I distilled the discussion um, in a way that might be helpful for this committee. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add one one thing and then I'll go to the public for um, comment and then come back to all of you. I think that the, the discussion from the board was really trying to better understand if we if we have limited funds, where's the highest need? And this speaks actually, Dave, to the issue that you raised earlier, which is that, you know, as part of our public safety and justice work, there are a whole bunch of needs that we have, including needing to rebuild the side of the building the DA's in because the West Wing is not earthquake stable. It really isn't. And so that's something we have to address. We have um, offices that we need to replace for the sheriff's office that were just knocked down um, in the jails. It, but more as importantly, in my mind, is the expanded resource, for example, of the reentry center, like actually building something out that was intended to be a no entry center or a place that you could get help. But the other is that I do believe that we have a need for some mental health facilities that are locked so that people who, who are really mentally ill can get, um, to, can get services and there are people, I live downtown and Maya and I both re represent very, very, very high need areas. And we see people all the time who, um, whether it's for whatever reason that are, are not mentally stable enough to even feed, feed or clothe themselves, right? So um, so I, I really, if we were gonna spend $300 million, which by the time we got this done, it will be closer to 400 million, then what would be the very best way to spend that resource? Now, we're, we're really talking about capital investments, not operational investments, because these are really one-time uh, funds. These are not ongoing funds that we have access to. So the, the staff got a big, uh, a big feedback, I think, from the way, what the board's thinking. I think feedback we're getting from the public and the community. And I also think recognizing that, that it's gonna be some time before are the county's resources are what they were. And so as we think about how we wanna spend those dollars, what's the best way to do that? That's really the, the sum that I would give, uh, summary I would give. So I'm gonna to go to the public uh, comment uh, speaker and then I'll come back to the group for any feedback and discussion. I'll start with you, Pablo, I saw your hand. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Scott Larson. I was on the uh, Justice and Public Safety meeting uh, when we were talking about the uh, construction of the new jail. I, I truly believe that we need a dignified psych ward and a actual real type of uh, rehab facility um, rather than people having to enter into the criminal justice system to get any type of help. I, I'm, I'm very worried that we're just building another jail to stockpile people in and not really help them. Has anybody ever really thought about possibly building something out of state? I, I, I mean, think about this. We, we, we need a drug rehab. The most important thing when you're getting off of methamphetamines is to stay away from people that do meth. I mean, you, you at least need to do this for six months to a year. Um, it takes about a year and a half before you're not really cuckoo in the head. Um, why not have a facility like that? It, it would be a lot cheaper to build it out of state. You could also build something in South County right on the tip of Santa Clara County um, for people to go that need help. People like myself, I would have gone somewhere for six months to a year. That would have been fantastic. My family would have been super proud of me and said, hey, great, you got into rehab. You're at a facility. You're not out in the mix anymore. This is great. And then I wouldn't have had to have utilized public comment as therapy either. Um, I, I think these are great ideas, and I worry that they just fall to the side. Um, this, this is what happens here. I needed help. I still need help. I still need drug treatment. I still need mental health services. And I still need somebody to talk to about why I cry myself to sleep at night. This has been very rough, and I'm coming on five years of being clean. 
You guys know I'm a success story, but this is sad that I have to live in your parking lot and defecate in bags because I can't even use a bathroom. It's just, it's just disgusting. And I'm one of 10,000 out there right now. So thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to go to pop. I don't have any other public speakers. I'm going to go to Pablo Gaxiola. Thank you again, guys. Um, I moved to my to my cell phone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So just one of the things that I, I, I wanted to acknowledge beforehand, and, and as you were speaking earlier, and I was looking at the whole process, I think it's more important for us as as you know committee members, but also as a community, to recognize and understand that the like you said, the building of the jail is, is one cost allocation that's like overall. In order to make the moves and the changes that a lot of people are suggesting I think would be a better idea, there have to be funds appropriated for those type of new programs and those new type of, of um, ideas to be implemented, right? So if we're going to move in one way, it's like, okay, we have the cost for the jail, but building the jail, the way that it's going to be operated is already covered under somebody else's budget. When we start thinking of making all of those moves, we also have to start. Oh, he lost Pablo. We'll see him when he comes back. Wes, I see you waving wildly. Okay. Uh, I, I'm a, a chaplain in a jail. Just returned three weeks ago after seven months being out of there. I've been a chaplain since 2009. I'm also a clinical social worker for 48 years. Um, and I've been on the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission. I think we need to start something with the new jail soon because the conditions there of being locked in and not being able to have uh, groups come in or uh, people come in to talk to them, it, it, it's going to just make it worse. And I, I've been, there's one man, that young man who I've been seeing every year that I've, I've been in a jail. And he's in, he's in the jail, gets rehab, goes out, stays out three months, and comes back. He's got a schizoaffective disorder, and uh, he just uh, has a grandiose thoughts. But I, I just think it's a crime that because of his uh, serious illness that he keeps coming back into the jail because they have minimal treatment there, and we need to work on we, we need to work on. Uh, intensive treatment for, for this, uh, psychotic disorders there. And I, I don't think that's happening. He keeps on coming back and coming back. And, and many people I see there have uh, serious mental illness. And, and the fact that they're, st they're just locked up in their cells all the time, it just makes it worse. And their, their, their mental health diagnoses need to be uh, looked at and being able to be treated all the time, not just uh, like uh, bandage work. And I, I'm really concerned about that because it, it, the conditions still are not that good in the jail. And it was 2015 when we were on the Blue Ribbon Commission, you know, when they didn't have enough underwear. So come on, let's, let's see what we can do in the jail. That's Thank it. You, Wes. Thank you. Pablo, you wanna try again? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so I just want to just put that thought out there about when we're looking at, you know, building out new things and new ideas that we also need to consider, you know, the, the whole idea of this decarceration is, is not just to limit the jail population, but take a look at, at, at rebuilding policies around how we, you know, we, we've been saying for a long time that we are criminalizing those with mental illness and we still continue to do that because we don't have an option or we don't have another way to go about doing it. Um, as building into that, you know, utilizing that same space for something that's like kind of right in between. It doesn't have, it can be a locked facility, but when you complete your, your, um, you know, your, once you're stable and you complete your, whatever the, um, the designated time period is for somebody that's going through, um, that, that they could be released without having a, an entry on their jet, on their jacket, you know, so they have their mental illness address. They have their, uh, the crime that they committed because of it. It satisfies both public safety. It, it satisfies both the punitive portion. But at the end of the day, the the intent of the crime was was done behind a mental illness. So they would leave with a clean record, and they don't have to go into the system just because of their mental mental health. So that's okay. just something I, I would hope that we consider. Mm -hmm. Which is truly alternative. Yeah. Yeah. 
other thoughts or comments that folks have? Supervisor Chavez, I, I completely agree with the statements that Wes and others are making about it. I mean, you, you know this very well, that um, this is one of our greatest challenges um, in, in the justice system is the uh, terrible circumstances where our clients um, are in custody and, and sometimes just because there's no other locked facility available in, in the county or even in the state, because keep in mind that the state is failing uh, completely in providing locked facilities for those that are incompetent to stand trial. I mean, we have people on wait lists that are sitting in our facility because the state is incap uh, incapable of, of housing those that are acutely sick. And so I think we do have to be extremely careful about if we are gonna build capacity for the mentally ill that we're not net widening so that by default, despite our good intentions, we are creating a locked facility within the jail that's gonna bring people in the jail rather than providing a separate uh, venue and a separate facility for appropriate and necessary treatment. And, and I think I'm sure you've heard this from others that are way more experts than we are, but you know, the combined experience from with Molly and all of us here from the justice perspective, this is a truly a significant problem. And I think that the building capacity, while well-intentioned, could give us unintended consequences that we have to be very careful about. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Are there other comments that, that folks have on this subject? No pearls of wisdom, no go long. It's all, okay. I will, um, the only thing I, I want to say is that I, I know that we have to, as one of our bodies of work, um, meet with providers of, um, of behavioral health services. And I also think we need to engage the folks that are at EPS and at um, the Barbara Aarons Pavilion. Because again, we can't have people that we're trying to treat in our behavioral health wards and then send them to the county jail. Like that's actually one of the, the most unhelpful things that we do because we don't have the appropriate facility for, for, for people who are, um, who have violence or other kinds of challenges that, that we don't think of as criminogenic behavior necessarily. We think of them as mental, mental health issues. And by the way, you guys, I'll just say, I think there's a lot about the human brain we don't know and that we're going to learn a lot. And, uh, but while we're doing that, we've got to we've got to have an eye toward making sure that there are appropriate placements for people. Because I, I think that you know one of the biggest challenges we have is we're letting people out of mental health facilities who are homeless, be, and frankly, because we can't keep them. But there's no place for them, right? And so part of the reason we built Measure A is we're trying to build as much housing as fast as we can. Part of the reason we're doing the unhoused task force is we're looking for options that include. Um, you know, sanctioned encampments and a bunch of other issues. Um, but a big part of it has got to be around how we manage treatment. And, you know, we don't have, um, you know, endless resources, but we do have to start investing in a system that, that properly cares for people um, and keeps people in the right, uh, that where we're putting people in the right place and not, not putting people together that we shouldn't. Um, and, you know, and my, I think one fear I have is that the best mental health facility in the county ends up being the jail. And that would be horrific. And we'd like to not do that. All right. So thank you, all of you. And if you have other thoughts, feel free to send me an email cause, uh, or to Martha, because we're really interested in getting people's options. Um, you know, high on my list is looking at this alternative placement, but also uh, investing in the reentry center and then the West Wing, because we've got to make sure it survives that earthquake. So uh, with that, we're going to go to our very last item. I just wanted to see if uh, Javier wanted to present. I apologize. I thought I, I missed this. But what you'll see in here is um, Javier's quarterly report. And I wanted to make sure if anybody had any questions while we had Javier, you could ask them. So this is quiz Javier time. I got no one, nothing. That's good. Javier, just for the record, we do that with Javier all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I wanted to say thank you for the report because it was Absolutely. really big, you know, a slight go to the freezer, get the box kind of thing. Again, you have to be older to know what that means. 
Um, all right, everyone. Well, listen, thank you for your interest and your care and your concern and um, for the really robust discussions and all of your feedback today. Uh, we, at our next meeting, let me just say for the record, our, our next meeting is at a different time. And Maya reminded me 32 times that we are meeting um, on December 16th at 2 instead of 2.30. Uh, and that's because I have a hearing after. So I will see you all December, um, Cindy? December 16th. Yes. Cindy, can I say one thing before we go? And, I, and Javier, sure, if, you could back, if you could back me up on this. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are aware, but our uh, reentry center is hosting a virtual 5K to support oh, um, that's a fundraiser right. for our uh, reentry clients. Um, if you guys don't have the information, the, the, the actual run will be from October 24th through November 7th, where you'll be able to log in your runtime. Any support or any, um, anybody has that's willing to join, please uh, email either myself or Javier, and we'll get you the information to get you registered. I'm so glad you reminded us. And Javier, could we just email that to the whole crew? Absolutely, and, and it's I a Rise Up and Run a Virtual 5K, and it's $25 to participate. And Martha already has her shirt, and yes. I'm in for the 25. Actually, I'll see who in my office wants to join. Oh, Miguel has and, a shirt too. And Maya's gonna race me. She just said that. She said she. Yeah. I can see her over there. She's like, I'm in. No, nice. uh, well, <laughs> that's nice. right, Maya and my and my council member colleague Maya. Yeah, we're all in. That's great. And, Thanks. Yes, we'll we are in. Here. Yeah, we are in, and we've raised over $3,600 for the for the run and the fundraiser. So oh, I'm great. very excited. And then yes. we surpassed our 200, we were aiming for 250 participants. We're over that. So just keep, keep signing up. Thank yeah, that is but, wonderful. Thank you. And we could just buy a shirt, right? That's Absolutely. right. Brother. I know those of us who don't run unless we're being chased by somebody else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Be well, be safe, wash your hands, wear your mask. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Pablo. Bye. The meeting has officially adjourned. Have a great day.